The house on the cliff looks like a ship disappearing into fog. The spire, a mast. The trees whipping against its base. The waves of a ravening sea. Or maybe Jane just has ships on the brain, seeing as she's inside one that's doing all it can to consume her attention. A wave rolls the yacht, catches her off balance, and she sits down, triumphantly landing in the general vicinity of where she aimed. Another wave propels her in slow motion against the yacht's lounge window. I haven't spent a lot of time in boats. I guess you get used to it, she says. Jane's traveling companion, Kieran, lies on her back in the lounge's long window seat, her eyes closed. Kieran isn't seasick. She's bored. She gives no indication of having heard. I guess my Aunt Magnolia must have gotten used to it, says Jane. My family makes me want to die, Kieran says. I hope we drown. This yacht is named the Kieran. Through the lounge window, Jane can see Patrick, who captains the yacht, on deck in the rain, drenched, trying to catch a cleat with a rope. He's young, maybe early twenties, a white guy with short dark hair, a deep winter tan, and blue eyes so bright that Jane had noticed them immediately. Someone was apparently supposed to be waiting on the dock to help him, but didn't show up. Kieran, says Jane, should we maybe help Patrick? Help him with what? I don't know, docking the boat? Are you kidding, says Kieran. Patrick can do everything by himself. Everything? Patrick doesn't need anybody, Kieran says. Ever. Okay, Jane says, wondering if this is an expression of Kieran's general equal opportunity sarcasm, or if she's got some specific problem with Patrick. It can be hard to tell with someone like Kieran. Outside, Patrick catches the cleat successfully. Then, his body taut, pulls on the rope, arm over arm, bringing the yacht up against the dock. It's kind of impressive. Maybe he can do everything. Who is Patrick, anyway? Patrick Yellen, Kieran says. Ravi and I grew up with him. He works for my father. So does his little sister, Ivy. So did his parents, until a couple years ago. They died in a car accident in France. Sorry, she adds with a glance at Jane. I don't mean to remind you of travel accidents. It's okay, Jane says automatically, filing these names and facts away with the other information she's collected. Kieran is British American on her father's side and British Indian on her mother's, though her parents are divorced and her father is now remarried. Also, she's revoltingly wealthy. Jane's never had a friend before who grew up with her own servants. Is Kieran my friend? thinks Jane. Acquaintance? Maybe my mentor? Not now, maybe, but in the past. Kieran, four years older than Jane, went to college in Jane's hometown and tutored Jane in writing while she was in high school. Ravi is Kieran's twin brother, Jane remembers. Jane's never met Ravi, but he visited Kieran sometimes in college. Her tutoring sessions had been different when Ravi was in town. Kieran would arrive late, her face alight, her manner less strict, less intense. Is Patrick in charge of transportation to and from the island? Asks Jane. I guess, Kieran says. Partly, anyway. A couple other people chip in, too. Do Patrick and his sister live at the house? Everyone lives at the house. So is it nice to come home? Asks Jane. Because you get to see the friends you grew up with? Jane is fishing. Because she's trying to figure out how these servant relationships work when one person is so rich. Kieran doesn't answer right away. Just stares straight ahead, her mouth tight, until Jane begins to wonder if her question was rude. Then Kieran says... I guess there was a time when seeing Patrick again after a long absence made me feel like I was coming home. Oh, says Jane. But not anymore? Uh, it's complicated, 
Kieran says, with a short sigh. Let's not talk about it now. He could hear us. Patrick would have to have superpowers to hear a word of this conversation. But Jane recognizes a dismissal when she hears one. Peering through the window, she can make out the shapes of other boats, big ones, little ones, vaguely, through the downpour, docked in this tiny bay. Kieran's father, Octavian Thrash IV, owns those boats. This bay, this island off the eastern seaboard, those waving trees, that massive house far above. How will we get to the house? She asks. She can see no road. Will we ascend through the rain like scuba divers? Kieran snorts, then surprises Jane by shooting her a small, approving smile. By car, she says, not elaborating. I've missed the funny way you talk. Your clothes, too. Jane's gold zigzag shirt and wine-colored corduroys make her look like one of Aunt Magnolia's sea creatures. A maroon clownfish, a coral grouper. Jane supposes she never dresses without thinking of Aunt Magnolia. Okay, she says. And when's the spring gala? I don't remember, Kieran says. The day after tomorrow, the day after that, it's probably on the weekend. There's a gala for every season at Octavian Thrash the Fourth's house on the sea. That's the reason for Kieran's trip. She's come home for the spring gala.